all very much. Uh, I am honored by the invitation. It is a, a thrill to be here. Uh, thank you kindly for it. And I hope my the comments and the remarks I'll be making, the, the story I'll be sharing will be of interest to you all. Let me begin by screen sharing. Let me make sure that this is working okay. All right, let me see. I'm going to grab this information here. Can you all see this okay? Can you see my screen, the, yes, the PowerPoint? Yes, yes we can Wonderful. see it. Wonderful, thank you so much. All right, so I I gave the title, the, the title of my talk is Elit Origin Stories, Awakening to the Potential of Digital Writing. And I want to begin really with, with a, sharing a little bit of my story and how I have a, what we could jokingly call an elit origin story, right? You know, in, in comic books, uh, superhero comics in particular, it's, it's common for these heroes, these characters to have an origin story, have a moment that how they get their powers, right? Being sent from another planet like Superman or Spider-Man being bitten by a radioactive spider. It is a very common story among folks who study and are into electronic literature to have a this kind of an origin story. And I wanna tell the beginnings of mine. My origins, the foundations, are in the 1980s when I was a teenager. I was born in 1970 uh, and I studied at a private school that offered computer classes. And I learned to program in AppleSoft Basic. You can see the, the kind of Apple IIe computer uh, that I kind of, well, at least that kind of a computer I used to learn. I also learned to program in Pascal. And uh, I won the computer science award upon graduation from high school. Uh, at the time, I also used computer labs at the University of Puerto Rico in Mayaguez. My father was a professor there. So even as a teenager, even before being a student there, I had access to computer labs and, and computers. And there I hung out with student hackers who pirated computer games and floppy disks and I participated in all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, I learned to use computer terminals using the early internet protocols like Gopher and IRC chat, internet relay chat. So I had pretty privileged access to computers from a formative age, really. And I played interactive fiction on computers and I played video games on the Atari 2600. And so as a teenager, I would create, I didn't know I was doing writing electronic literature, but I would write these little computer programs in basic that would make the words pop on the screen in random locations, things like that. Really simple. It was this sort of playful, young engagement with writing in digital media. I fell in love with literature and poetry and went on to study English at the University of Puerto Rico in Mayaguez, starting my studies in 1988. And, you know, in my that's the beginning of my sort of college and beyond graduate school student life. I, as an English major in college, I deepened my study of literature and poetry. And I also along the way discovered comics and the expressive potential of images and text when they work together. And that was really powerful for me. I liked it so much. I was so interested in it that I went to Bowling Green State University, which at the time had, I thought was the largest collection of comic books held by a library. Turns out it was the second largest still. They were also the publishers of the Journal of Popular Culture. And I went there and I studied literature in English, but I also, I wrote my master's thesis on comics. And my master's thesis was based on Neil Gaiman's approaches to comic books and graphic novels and the Sandman. 
which is rather an exciting time now that the Sandman is being made and, you know, has been made into a, a, a Netflix show. As an instructor, upon return, finishing my master's, I went back to UPR Mayagüez and worked for five years as an instructor with a master's degree. And during that time, I researched and taught literature, comics, and film. I fell in love with film, the language of film, and really it helped me understand between comics and film, and of course, literature and writing, I was thinking about multimodality before Gunther Kress had coined the term and really kind of developed the whole theory of multimodality. That was in the future, right? Media studies, that existed, right? But, but you know, I'm, I, here I am seeing these different kinds of materials working in different ways and all being powerful modes of expression. My awakening happened in 1999. I went to University of Maryland for my doctoral studies, seeking to study poetry and film. And then in my first semester, I took a course with Neil Freistat that introduced me to electronic literature and boom, all my interests coalesced. The programming computation, multimodality, images, text, comics, time-based media, film, and then poetry, e-poetry, reconfiguring the line and text and digital media, including programming. The text you see here kind of moving along the, the side here is Seattle Drift by Jim Andrews, a poem created in dynamic HTML back in 1997, one of the first pieces I encountered and fell in love with. In 2000, 2001, I attended the first e-poetry conference and festival in Buffalo, New York. And there I met Jim Andrews, Giselle Bagelman, David Knobel, Philippe Botts, and many other people who are now established names in the field. And I discovered that there was a community of practice. So I got to meet the artists. I was I began to be immersed in, in the world of academia and scholars doing research in this area. And that was it. That just sent me down the path. My dissertation, I wrote with Matthew Kirschenbaum and Martha Nell Smith, and it was titled Typing the Dancing Signifier, Jim Andrews, Viz Poetics. And it is a single author study on Jim Andrews' work. Some career highlights along the way. I joined the ePoetry Advisory Board in 2012-15. I became a digital culture Fulbright scholar at University of Bergen, which is probably the greatest concentration of scholars in the field of electronic literature and digital culture in the world. I had the chance to go and teach and do research with them for a year. I launched my I Heart E Poetry or I Love E Poetry scholarly blog. For those who don't know the story, I what the day after I found out I was going to Bergen on that Fulbright. So this is December 2011. I realized that I needed to refresh my reading. And so I set myself this goal that I would read one e poem every day in a would write something, a critical response to it, brief. At first I did 100 words. After that, I went more to 250, 300 words on average. And, and then I would do it every day, not missing a day. And so I went on to do that for 500 days in a row. So I started that December, I think 21st in 2011. And I wasn't finished until May of 2013, and it was whew, quite the adventure. Anyways, on the work I did with I Heart E Poetry, or I Love E Poetry, I call it interchangeably, I, I was invited to join the ELO Board of Directors. I started out as treasurer, quickly became vice president, and I just finished this year presiding, doing my, my three-year term as president. 
and it was a, a great privilege to to lead the organization. Uh, I, the Red de Literatura Electrónica Latinoamericana, the Latin American ELIT Network, LITELAT, I joined the steering committee in 2015, and, and I'm still part of the steering committee. I co-edited the Electronic Literature Collection, Volume 3. I co-edited the first anthology of Latin American electronic literature. It was released in 2020. And I joined the Taper Editorial Collective, and I'm still part of that team. Uh, we publish minimalist works of electronic literature. And so you can see I, I, this has been my life, right? I mean, once I had that awakening, I just kind of went right into it. And the question, right, the, the, the thing I want to question here is why does ELIT require an awakening? Where is this coming from? Well, if we think orality and poetry as a mnemonic technology is as old as humanity. We learn about this through Walter J. Ong, who has theorized this topic very well. Manuscript writing te technologies are thousands of years old. Print technologies are hundreds of years old. And literature, as we know it, has developed with these technologies, orality, manuscript, print. Mass literacy, school systems, modern universities, bureaucracies developed with manuscript and print technologies, right? And literary authorship, markets, the literary market, aesthetics, criticism, and our very disciplined English departments developed in the age of print. Yet computers and digital media are just decades old. So this new thing, that has come that's just a few decades old is competing with, you know, orality, with manuscript, with print, and with all of the disciplines that have grown and developed around those technologies. And now here we have this newcomer and we're still thinking in the modalities that are older to us as a society. I would say that the page exerts a hegemonic control over writing. And that includes how we approach the digital. So what is the hegemony of the page? Everything we know about writing and literature is shaped by the page. I mean, there's writing and, 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 and clay on walls, right? But but day to day, the writing that we do the page is the sort of, is where it inhabits it. And the page exerts its hegemonic control over writing and literature. Even in digital media, our base concept is the page. When we think about email, it's the concept is mail. You send a piece of paper from one place to another, from one address to another. But this is electronic, right? Okay, ebooks. You have the, the, the same book that would have been published in print, but now it's delivered through digital devices. But it's the same thing. It's remediated onto that space. Web pages, we still call them pages, and so on. Let's explore this further. Text, what are some of the rules of the hegemony of the page? Well, text is static. And a text is considered to be a sequence of words chosen by a human writer. That rules out a lot of the cyborg or hybrid writing that we do with generation, with text generation. Multimodality, it's fine for pop culture, but literature is pure, pure writing, just text. Literary merit is judged by aesthetic standards developed for print culture. So when we encounter a book of generative poetry or an e-poem, we don't have the aesthetic tools to appreciate it, or at least many people don't. It can be cultivated. Literature genres that developed in print culture persist today, and I have no problem with that. But innovative writing is in digital media is either shuttled off to a corner as experimental writing or pop culture. 
and then dismissed as pop culture. So to engage in digital writing requires a rebellion against the page and the literary establishment that to this day has not adapted well to digital media spaces. So digital writing offers us a choice. And of course, I'm referencing The Matrix, not an accident that it came out in 1999, the time of my own awakening into ELIT. Here's the blue pill and here's the red pill, right? Offered to Neo by Morpheus. The blue pill, if you take the blue pill, you return to print culture, you disregard everything. You continue to use computers to produce writing in the modalities and genres established by print culture. You use your word processor, you print out the document, you, you know, that kind of thing. You write documents designed for print and the ebooks, which is just remediated print. You write novels the way you used to write novels, you write stories the way you used to write stories. You underutilize digital media as a space for creativity and innovation. You treat media as separate entities. Text is here, images are there, audio is over there, video is over there. They're all separate things. But we know that computers bring all of these together and you can compose things together. You can write not on the page, but on video. You can write on music, you can write on images, or you take the red pill and you explore digital media's potential. You can tell which pill I took. You awaken to the potential of electronic literature and digital writing. You see what new forms and genres emerge from engaging digital media. And these are just some that I just kind of came off my, the top of my head but generative pieces, bots, memes, digital journalism, installation, network performances, kinetic typography, video poetry, video games, et cetera. So let's take a peek at a, a, a very contemporary published authoritative definition of electronic literature. And this is the, the, the definition offered in the Electronic Literature Collection, Volume 4, which came out just a few months ago. Uh, and, and this definition is by leading scholars, right? Kathy Edmund Behrens, John Murray, Laos Keynes, Ruy Torres, and Mia Zamora. They define it, the electronic literature as all ELIT works involve interaction with technology, which can occur at any stage in the process from conception to reception. ELIT works to some degree or another incorporate one, literary qualities co-produced by human and algorithmic interaction, two, formal and or conceptual innovation, and three, a transforming experience for readers through expressive algorithms. I really like this definition. I think they, 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 they are touching on many of the areas of where electronic literature, where the interventions happen in that interaction with digital media technologies. Uh, notice that there's this formal and or conceptual innovation, uh, which is interesting because it's, it's that sort of rebellion against the page in a way. Uh, and, Anyways, I, I think it's a solid definition. I think it's worth uh, building upon. Now I'm going to offer a simpler definition, one that I like to use. And it's literature, electronic literature is literature that engages the expressive potential of digital media beyond the limits of the page. So notice that I'm pushing against the page. It's a, whether it's print or virtual, the page, and that it's hegemonic, it's cultural weight, right? That, that we're kind of transcending it. And ELIT resists the hegemony of the page and thrives in the potential digital media office. All right. Now, digital writing is something larger, broader than electronic literature. It's basically the same thing as electronic literature minus the literature. 
So if you just cross out elit and literature and you just put in digital writing, let's read what digital writing is. Digital writing is writing that engages the expressive potential of digital media beyond the limits of the page. Digital writing resists the hegemony of the page and thrives in the potential digital media offers. Why create this distinction? Well, electronic literature predates digital writing as a concept. Experimentation, I mean, so, so as a concept, the literary, right? Well, let's talk about this in more detail. Experimentation is natural to literature and draws attention in academia. In academia, Matthew Kirstenbaum made this excellent point in a keynote he gave at the ELO conference in Porto, Portugal in 2017. He made the point that academia rewards difficulty and experimentation in literature, which has allowed electronic literature to thrive. And academia offers a prestige economy for e-literature in academic and artistic circles. And that has limited mainstream adoption and sets a very high bar. These are circles that are not that easy to get into. And I know that there is much more digital writing going on nowadays than electronic literature because it is massive. Let me explain a little further. Well, here's some examples of, here's an example of electronic literature. Anna Crutch has uh, accounts both in TikTok and Instagram. You'll see when I talk about elite generations, this is an example of what's known as third generation electronic literature. She uses Instagram to create these little stories that use, they have 10 frames. And here I, I'm just kind of automated, kind of skipping from panel to panel, but to read the story, right? Is, is she's working with very specific constraints, the format that Instagram allows. And it always starts with a person and it tells their story. And there are wonderful stories. I discovered Anna Crutch uh, actually about a month ago. Wonderful person, wonderful artist. Here's an example of digital writing. This is kinetic typography. Uh, this person uh, at italiano.jpg on Instagram is basically making language dance, making you know, kinetic typography. There's, this is not literary. This is not a poem. This is not trying to be literary. It just is, but it is writing, numerical writing in this case, right? But it is putting language, it's putting numbers, it's putting letters on screen and exploring what it can do. And I think that's wonderful. That's, I mean, again, the literary puts a lot of pressure on it. What if we just celebrate this as writing? Here's another example. Neil Agarwal has created a number. He has a wonderful website called neil.fun. And I think fun is, is a very good way to describe what he does. The deep sea is basically an infographic, really, as you scroll down, down the screen, the, the, notice that it gets darker. As you go deeper into the sea, it uses the scrolling mechanism to kind of give you a sense of depth. And it's showing all of the animals and creatures and we get information about how, you know, about some of them in details. And it's this wonderful piece and you get to learn. It's actually rather huge. Notice that I'm grabbing the bar and I'm scrolling down quickly just to give you a sense of how deep it goes. So if you're reading this on a phone, you are moving that thing. You are scrolling and scrolling for a long time. And it's a work that is very rewarding, but it's not literary. It's not operating in a literary mode. It's just fun digital writing. And so... These are just a couple of examples of how digital writing is this sort of bigger thing that's happening that 
really examines and helps us explore and understand how right how writing itself as a practice is being transformed. And of course, those insights are useful for our understanding of electronic literature. So let's talk about the generational model. So you may be aware, right, that that Kate Hales and Catherine Hales, uh, Christopher Funkhauser, they both kind of built and established this model of the first generation of electronic literature and the second one. And uh, in 2018, 19, I proposed the third generation of electronic literature, an idea that has proven to be uh, actually well taken, but also with, with some controversy. And I'll explain that in a moment. The first generation is pre-web, 1951 to 1994, right? And includes mainframe computers and early PCs. The second generation is web. So 1995 to the present, it has this modernist aesthetic of difficulty. It's very experimental and it's high culture. It's literary, it, it moves very well in academic circles and gallery spaces. Now, third generation in the list could be described as post web or at least post open web. And it emerges around 2007 and it's ongoing. And it uses mobile, touch screen, and social media platforms with widespread adoption. And it rejects that modernist aesthetic of difficulty, right, of experimentation for more accessibility. And and it's, it's the kind of popular culture to the high culture of second generation elites. And this includes works in Instagram, works like Anna Crutch, uh, a lot of the work that, that is out there that, you know, it may not have a large capital L literary ostentation or intent, but it is certainly uh, operating in literary modes in many cases. But it was also my first attempt to capture the idea of digital writing. I think a lot of third generation electronic literature is not that literary and it is actually digital writing. Now, what's the problem with this model? It works well for the US and Europe and their allies because they had privileged access to computers and digital technologies. So that first generation, it's, it's all them, right? Or mostly them. They had a head start. Countries on the other side of the digital divide have had limited opportunities to develop electronic literature. And so let's explore that idea a little further. So understanding the digital divide. So computers were developed by the military during World War II for code breaking. Uh, you know, Alan Turing was involved in all that. Then it went to companies dedicated to power, electronics, industrial machinery, right? IBM, Hewlett Packard, Ferranti, and then universities and research labs. And so that's where computers, right, were first used and developed. And all these companies were in the US, England, and Europe. And then they had subsidiaries around the world. But the sort of headquarters, the, the sort of development spaces were frequently in, in those main countries. Now, most foundational technologies, programming languages, ASCII, Unicode, the World Wide Web Consortium, et cetera, are developed by organizations and companies in the US, England, Europe, and allies. And until about 25 years ago, computers were expensive, as was internet access. And in some places, it is still expensive and beyond people's reach. Smartphones outpace personal computer ownership, especially among minorities in these countries, like the US and so on. So there's a digital divide within these countries, but also in developing countries. If we look at a, a little bit of data here, we can see the growth of people using the internet. So one of the axes was understanding, right, the, the access to computers. 
But then the other direction is people using the internet. Notice that in North America, the use of the internet, yeah, it grew, but it has remained a relatively stable, a small growth, whereas East Asia and the Pacific has had exponential growth. Notice that it reached a large amount of the population sooner in North America than in the rest of the world, even Europe, right? Latin America, Middle East. So you can see more access. That's a big part of the digital divide. Continuing here, ICT skills. So this is information and communication technology skills, right? Low ICT skills remain a barrier to meaningful participation in a digital society. This is a, a study that was done by the International Telecommunications Union. And, you know, really 15% of the countries had more than 10% of individuals who had written a computer program using a specialized programming language. So really advanced ICT skills are very, very hard to come by in the developing world. And it's growing. It's improving because there is a great need for that area. Privilege is another aspect of the digital divide. When people, um, you know, this is this famous Maslow's hierarchy, right? Electronic literature, like who has time to dedicate to exploring computer programs that are going to make language jump up and down on the screen and do all kinds of things if you are not at a point at which you're, I mean, if you're worried about your safety or you're just, you know, having a community and all these, you're, you're not, you're not going to be experimenting with this, right? right? So again, there is a level of, you know, privilege that allows for creativity and community. The electronic literature organization is an example of a community, but many countries don't have uh, such an organization. And of course, this organization developed primarily in the United States and Europe and has expanded and it welcomes all. But again, it, what happens frequently is that people discover the ELO and join the organization and they suddenly feel, I found my people. I found people that understand what I'm talking about. The important thing is to create other organizations, regional, and start connecting. Now, when we think about these generations, this generational model, and we think about access, ICT skills, and community, look how it maps out. So the first generation, pre-web, first you required access to mainframe and later on personal computers. What percentage of the population do you think had access to these things? It was very, very limited. To use, even if you had access to that, you needed to be an advanced programmer. I mean, th this was not for amateurs. You're using punch cards, or later on with a personal computer, you were using you know, programs like BASIC and Pascal and other things. And community, well, there was a, a scientific community. There were some programmers. There were magazines like Byte, publishers like Eatscape Systems. So there was the beginnings of community, but that's towards the end of that first generation, leading up, I would say, 80s and early 90s. That's where it built up a little bit. Now, the second generation, 1995 to the present, well, access to personal computers, that was a lot more uh, available, a lot more affordable, at least in the US and, and, and so on. Internet, web hosting, right, became a lot more available and accessible. It still required advanced ICT skills, but if you were able to use software like intermediate ICT skills using authoring software like Flash, then suddenly 
that gave access to a whole generation of creators and practitioners. And then that's when communities really started to develop academic conferences, art festivals, galleries, academic organizations. I mean, that's when it really took off and is still building and because this goes on to the present, right? And I, I would say that most of us are second generation folks. The third generation, and here's where the magic happens. First of all, you have access to personal computers, but also to mobile digital devices, internet, social media networks, apps, platforms, right? And these things only require standard ICT skills, using an app, using software, using platforms that are designed to be intuitive. So for example, if you're using Tech Talk, you record a video and you can use the very program, the very software on that app to add text at different moments. And in a way, what you're doing is you're writing on video and then you're adding whatever special effects and then you're adding music, pow, and you send that out into the world. To do that in the second generation required pretty advanced skills, maybe Flash, then you had to host it and you had to circulate it, you know, through academic conferences or put it on the web and see if someone found it. But TikTok is the distribution platform. People develop reputations and followings. They have things go viral, things move, right? Same with Instagram, same with Twitter and other spaces. And community. It doesn't have to be an academic community, which can be hard to get into. You need certain credentials to get into academic communities, right? But social media networks, everyone has access. Communities of practice, a hashtag that people operate under. Kinetic typography, for example, there's a whole bunch of people producing and sharing things there, having followers, having influ becoming influencers, and so on. And so when we think about my ELIT origin, let's call it my ELIT privilege story, I was very privileged. I had access to personal computers and video games from an early age. I had the opportunity to learn programming. That's an advanced ICT skill in high school. I had access to cutting edge education in prestigious universities. I had access and connected with a community of artists and scholars. And I had an, hang on, an academic career that rewards scholarship and creativity in electronic literature. And even getting an academic job, having tenure, this is not easy these days. So again, I have been exceedingly privileged. And ELIT practitioners, in Puerto Rico, it's, it's, it's me, there's Roberto Nacar, who I met recently, and some of my students who have done, who have created ELIT after I shared it with them. But Puerto Rico does not have the conditions to have a lot of ELIT practitioners. Uh, we do have digital writers, quite a few. So in creating new e-literary histories, we need to, each country, each region needs to discover its electronic literature and digital writing and establish their own generational frameworks. You don't need to, I mean, what second generation, what, what generations of Indian electronic literature are there? I think you need to tell your story. These generational frameworks may emerge beyond technological development and maybe more aligned with the spaces and cultural movements that give rise to ELIT and digital writing. Transcending the page, whether it's physical and virtual or virtual, by embracing is critical. And I think we need to go beyond the literary. There are many more practitioners of digital writing than of electronic literature. Meme makers, digital journalists, kinetic typographers, YouTubers, TikTok users, Instagram users, Snapchat users, and other social media users who create digital content that includes writing in ways that transcend the page, they're all doing digital writing. 
social media, mobile touchscreen platforms have vibrant spaces for experimentation and creativity with writing. They're not thinking of their, and these folks are not creating of their, create, not thinking of their creations as literary and wouldn't want to because it limits their uses. And audience, digital writing is useful. Lit, electronic literature has its uses, but it just is, right? That's the glory of literature. And the concept of the literary becomes a limiting concept when it comes to understanding many contemporary digital writing practices. So the call to action, and I'm wrapping up, cultivate electronic literature and digital writing in academia, galleries, and other cultural spaces. Develop local and regional histories, anthologies, and databases of this phenomenon. Create zines and other publications that publish original works of electronic literature and digital writing. You have to cultivate audiences and have them come back to the work. And you need to make this work be sustainable so it can, you can really cultivate audiences and, and just continue encouraging work. Develop frameworks that empower people to create elit and digital writing without advanced ICT skills. For example, Cheap Bots Done Quick is a wonderful engine to create and host bots. And I've created a whole bunch of bots using Cheap Bots Done Quick. And I've given many workshops and helped many people create. And there's thousands of people creating bots using Tracery and Cheap Bots Done Quick, which does not require you to know JavaScript, which is quite frankly, not that easy to use. Create awards and yearly competitions for original work in this area. And teach ELIT and digital writing and have your students write in this modality. Thank you. And I'm sharing for more information on some of my work, you can see my blog, leonardoflores.net. And you can contact me at leo at eliterature.org. Thank you all. Thank you, Professor Flores. It was really a very enlightening, interesting, and you know, very vivid presentation. I hope you know many of the many you know of our practitioners. And there are many people who have registered, though they are not participants. And I'm sure you know many of them are looking forward. Of course, you are an icon, you know, and a legendary character, you know, in you know uh, electronic literature. <laughs> Whoever you know follows it, you know, so we are so glad to have you and we cannot thank you enough, you know, and I hope, you know, there would be some questions where our reporter would be, you know, uh, this, uh, Aditi, do you, do, do you have any questions from the audience? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Professor Flores. We have uh, yes. lots of uh, yeah. uh, comments in the chat box. Um, I have Prakriti's question here in the chat box. She says, thank you for your insightful address, Professor Flores. What are your thoughts regarding the concept of bookishness developed by Jessica Pressman? Oh, this is one of the books that, that I, I, I have waiting to read, but I've not quite read yet. So I cannot give you an answer. I love Jessica Pressman's work. By the way, her work on digital modernism was really fundamental in helping me understand and, and come up with the concept of third generation electronic literature. But I'm afraid I cannot give you a, a, an opinion on bookishness. It's a book that I'm dying to read, but I haven't had the opportunity to read quite yet. So if you'd like to pull out a concept from there and post it in the chat, I'd be happy to address that. Okay, I um I also <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> I have a comment here from Shumona Mukherjee who's writing how beautifully books are creating meanings to our lives in this digital age. Uh, perhaps she's talking about the aesthetics of book making. Also, mm -hmm. uh, Shamya Roy is writing Jessica Pressman's bookishness is one of one of my recent favorites. To be honest, happy to connect Prakriti. Okay, a lot of a uh, lot of thanks about how enriching the session was. Um, mm -hmm. Also, I um, 
I have a question here from Akib Sabir, who is writing. Um, could you please briefly repeat the distinction you made between e-literature and digital writing? It seemed to me yes. that literature is more like mixing of media, whereas digital writing is where one media overwrites another. Well, I would say both participate on on, on the same thing. They're they're essentially the same thing. But on electronic literature, so both are these sort of rich engagements of writing in digital media, right? And and I mentioned writing, but not like, for example, in a video game, someone may have written the story and they have written the programming for the video game, but the video game itself is may have a narrative experience to it, right? But I would not consider that e-literature or digital writing because what the player is doing is not necessarily reading. You need to have some reading. You need to have language on the screen. And that language on screen needs to be doing something that is of interest from either a digital and a literary perspective or a digital writing perspective. So in a way, digital writing reinvents writing, makes us rethink writing itself in digital spaces, right? So for instance, what is a good presentation of language? How, how do words inhabit screens in productive ways, right? And how we can charge words and language with meaning, not just what, because of what it says, but what it does on the screen and under what conditions. You see? So really the difference is the intent, whether it's literary or not, right? It's like Neil Lagarwal's the, the Deep Sea is not poetic. It's not telling a story. It's not registering. So when we look at Neil Lagarwal's The Deep Sea from the point of view of literature, we don't have the, the critical vocabulary we have does not help us understand the piece better. The piece is, it's a, it's a presentation of information in an amusing, interesting, engaging way. Maybe we could think of it as a kind of essay writing and then bring the literary back in, that's fine. But I just wanna take the pressure with the concept of digital writing, I wanna remove the pressure of the literary which comes with great baggage of expectations, aesthetics, all of that, and really just let us appreciate how this is expressing as writing. Right. <clears throat> I also have a question here from Professor Onuradha Ghosh, and she's writing a wonderful lecture, Professor, what are the implications on physical and emotional health of users owing to addiction to digital media creations? Well, you know, uh, once upon a time, people were worried about reading. You know, it's very passive. You're spending all this time. Like I remember when I was a teenager growing up in Puerto Rico, I would, I would, I lived in the farm and my dad always wanted us to go help in the farm. And yet, and, and so I did. And we did, but a lot of my time, if I had free time, I wanted to be reading books, novels, on a hammock, in a rocking chair, in whatever comfortable chair there was before the afternoon rains came in. And I would spend all this time, if they let me, I would spend all day reading. And my dad would worry and would say, you need to get out there and exercise and do other things. And you could say I was addicted to books. And that may have affected my social skills, right? Also living in the country and so on. And so I think it's all in how you see it, right? If you are concerned that people are spending too much time playing video games or doing other things, that's fine. Uh, I think people need to diversify their activities. I, as a father, do worry if my child or my children are spending too much time using digital media devices and I do want them to get out there and 
do physical activity because it's healthy for them and it's good for them. But really, I wouldn't put that much pressure on the digital. I think uh, everything takes its toll. I think people need to lead balanced lives. And I think that's the more important thing. I don't know if electronic literature is is the culprit. It's probably a lot of other things that are the culprits uh, of, of the kinds of addictions that digital media create. Uh, Other okay. questions? These were pretty much yeah. the questions in the chat box, but I am also particularly curious about um, what, I mean, how does originality, because when you talked about how to develop proper cultures of digital media and digital creations, you talked about how we have to reward original creations and take that into account and all of that. But I think the problem, I mean, there is a, there must be a problem regarding, I mean, asserting the originality of a creation more so in digital media. So how do you see that spanning out in, in the future? Well, you know, I, the, you know, right now with the whole debacle around the conversation around chat GPT, and some other AI uh, generating, you know, tools. The fact that they are these tools have become quite sophisticated and can and can can generate right uh, a lot of I don't know basic writing that 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 used to be assigned. There's a lot of concern around that. I'm personally not terribly concerned. I think it will. It, it's a real threat to I don't know. Uh, not particularly interesting writing prompts, for example. <laughs> uh, give me your reaction to this poem. Well, anyone could just go and chat GPT and cheat themselves out of an education, out of an experience of actually working with a literary work. However, I do think these things are, are interesting in terms of, so, I mean, talk about a threat to originality, right? But I think the cyborg conversations, the people using these technologies to enhance the work that they're doing, I think that's really fascinating. Uh, I myself recently put together and submitted to paper a zine that, that I'm co-editor of. I submitted, I created a work of, of computational literature because I know programming, but I'm not very good. I'm, I, I call myself a hacker, like, like a hacker auteur, because I can take someone's code and hack it and modify it so that it does what I want it to do, sort of. Uh, but this time I used ChatGPT to generate the HTML and JavaScript code that I'm not good at generate the basic framework. And then I went to work on that framework and made it work on my own, right? And I used the tool to help me debug and make that thing work. And so I created a new work in conversation with ChatGPT. It is an original work. Uh, and yet it was done in a very uh, cyborg kind of practice. So I think we're gonna get a lot more cyborg writing uh, and I think originality well, well we'll see right I see a few more questions in the chat uh, well we have uh, we have a very pointed question by Kavisha who is writing sir how can we analyze the in between mm -hmm. space and e-literature in print literature we have this concept of reading in between the lines for example, in case of hypertext, we have a second or so with us when we move from one chunk to another. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, I, I yeah, I think part of what you're talking about is close reading. And when you have a work that is time-based or that is moving and it doesn't let you, or it changes, right? If you're reading a work like Toroka Gorge by Nick Montfort, and you have this poem being generated and moving down the screen, the only way to stabilize that text is to do a screen capture and then carefully read between it, between the lines, or to read and let it flow and let it understand and maybe get a sense of what's happening until you realize that you are reading the algorithm, you're reading the generational pattern 
pattern behind. And maybe you go and look at the source code and then you read that closely. And so what's happening is that our very concepts of reading and our reading practices and our critical practices change. If you assign a class to go read a generative poem like Taroko Gorge by Nick Monfort, everyone's going to read a different poem, but they will have also read the same work. They will have read many different texts, many different iterations, many different outputs, but they're still reading the same basic set of things. And so it, it, it becomes, uh, it expands, I think, our idea of close reading and reading between the lines. Right, thank you. Uh, we also have another question by Mohini who is writing. Uh, can you please explain how hypertext helps in exploring digital media? Hypertext helps in exploring the, well, hypertext is great because, I mean, it's, it's one of the ones, it's one of those early genres that we're all very used to, right? For a while, when when in the you know late 1980s and early 90s, when Eastgate Systems was publishing serious hypertext, right, and hypertext fiction, it was doing really sophisticated stuff and it was very innovative. And I think many of the experiments that they did then and published are still innovative and interesting today right now we have systems like twine now we have become used to reading hypertext online all the time right we're reading things full of links that we might go and follow and yet so so that is one aspect of digital media that has become internalized by massively and i think for people to write hypertext fiction, this is, I think, one of the reasons why Twine games have become so successful, because they are accessible. They're not conceptual. People know what to do. Ah, I'm presented with a choice. I'm going to click on this and take this choice. And here I go. And so it's wonderful. I mean, and, <laughs> and that is an, an easy thing to teach. Well, easy enough to teach people how to do, to create a hypertext and, and read it, right? Um, okay, Prakriti has a very specific point to make regarding um, Jessica Pressman's mm -hmm. work. And that's mm -hmm. there in the chat box. Uh, it's, I mean, it's uh, written uh, extensively there. Maybe you can respond. Yeah, I'm reading it right now. Let's see. The chat box itself or... Otherwise, let me read it out loud so I can read it. Uh, shall I read it out for you? Uh, in bookishness, loving books in, in digital age, Jessica Pressman charts a pervasive cultural and aesthetic trend beginning in the year around 2000 when anxieties about Y2K bug paired with the introduction of now familiar digital platforms and environments, Google, Wikipedia, Web2. The Kindle, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, etc. spawned a complex set of rela new relationships to books, paper, and ways of reading and writing that the digi digital age was appearing to challenge, occlude, or even replace. Anyone working with books and paper during that time will remember the anxious prognostications and the decline narratives that digital media seemed to be precipitating. The end of print, the end of books, the end of bookstores and libraries, the end of newspapers, the end of reading as we knew it and loved it. Bookishness reveals how writers and other artists registered the sense of ending, explored its implications and sometimes managed to discover new life for print and the book in the process. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, you know, I remember the anxieties uh, of the era. And this was a time you have to understand that in parallel to these anxieties, right? This was also the time where the music industry was under just a severe an attack in terms of shifting from a model of selling CDs, right? Selling objects to now music can be ripped and shared as an MP3 file. And all of a sudden, the music industry, this was a time of crisis, not just for the book industry, but for the music industry as well. 
and 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 the video eventually we got to where we had the bandwidth so that video really started to shift to streaming services right now they're uh, omnipresent but at that time right it was a, a a moment of radical shift and of course the music industry adapted rather effectively by having digital rights management you have itunes and being able to sell music at a price point that was accessible to many. Now we're at a stage where we have things like Pandora and Spotify that are doing more algorithmic uh, things, and they're able to pay artists, right? Uh, you know, so, so, so different models have emerged. I think the music industry has adapted very well to that. And part of that adaptation came to shifting sales to, to concerts, right? And live experiences. And now newer generations really seek out these live experiences. Now, with the book and with print, what happened is that the book was freed from being everything to becoming something that is special, right? And so what was the response from the, the print world? Well, let's come up with e-readers, right? And you have the Kindle and you have you know, Amazon's Kindle and Nooks and all of these other devices that, that, and even iPads and apps, right? So you can read your book on your phone or you can read it on a book. And so of course, the early trend of innovation, the, the, the fact that you could carry your whole library on a little pocket device and access it and read it. And yet it's so hard to take notes on that thing, right? But even now, Kindle is still trying to come up with the, the sort of the version that lets you now take notes on it by hand. I mean, now we've come all full circle and now we have iPads and Apple pencils, right? That suddenly are restoring manuscript to 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 spaces where we could only enter through digital keyboards and and virtual keyboards. And so I think what's happened is that the the book, and I think Jessica Pressman uh, goes into much more depth, right, on on the value that that we find. And, and, and the love we have in books. And if you think about the book now, you understand the book as an immersive device that comes with no interruptions, with no clocks, with no, right? And that, that you can underline and mark and, 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 and leave traces on. Uh, and that becomes sort of part of you. And even bookstores have changed, right? The, the the big, I don't know, at least in the US and Puerto Rico, the 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 mall variety kind of a uh, bookstore, the Barnes and Nobles and the Borders and all of those things that used to sell not just books, but CDs and media objects, right? Now we have bookstores that are curated, that are more experiences, that are more spaces where you can kind of want to spend time in and discover things that have been sort of intervened with. And so I think it's, it's you know, as much as I love electronic literature and digital writing, I love books as well. I was formed uh, by them. And I think all of these expressions of writing and literature can coexist. It's not a blue pill or red pill. It, it's it's you can take the red pill and still love books. And so I think it's important to remember that. Right. Uh, those were pretty much the questions. Thank you, Professor, for those very detailed and insightful answers. I would now pass it on to Shimima. Thank you. Thank you for those questions, folks.
Shimi ma'am, you're muted. Yeah. So anyway, thank you, uh, uh, Professor Flores. Uh, I'm extremely sorry to those viewers who had joined at exactly the time that Professor Flores was about to, you know, present his, you know, keynote speech. And we had to bring it forward because, you know, RVC and register was, you know, could not be present. So anyhow, for those who have missed the lecture, we have already done the recording and that will be made available in our, you know, departmental YouTube channel. So that is, you know, uh, something that, you know, I really, you know, uh, there was something out of our control. Many people were there actually who joined exactly at the time when your speech was scheduled. <laughs> anyhow, so thank you once more, Prof. Flores, for taking off time from your busy schedule and, you know, giving this wonderful keynote speech and i hope there are many who really would have wanted to ask more questions but that i think so i would now like to hand over you know uh, to our you know hod officiating you know hod professor mukesh ranjan uh, to offer his vote of thanks thank you thank you professor flores it was wonderful listening to your uh, brilliant you know presentation on uh, e-literature, e-lit, and your uh, observations about you know, digital uh, writings. Uh, so uh, as, a, as a carry home, uh, we walk away with both the blue pill and the red pills. <laughs> so that was indeed, indeed, you know, uh, wonderful. You know, I, I really admired uh, your observations you know, on digital writing, you know, which involves, you know, rebellion against the page you know so that has given us you know plenty of uh, you know uh, it's, a, it's a food for thought you know and i'm sure our students you know and our colleagues you know would have you know plenty to reflect upon so thank you so much you know once again for taking time out you know from your schedule and to be with us you know at this time of the day and uh, we look forward to you know hosting you sometime you know physically not virtually yes you know, in yes. uh, the Department of English, uh, Jamia Melia Islamia, and uh, look forward to continuing our engagement, you know, and interactions with you. And I'm sure our students, you have shared your, uh, uh, you know, uh, contact you know, address, the electronic address, and I'm sure our students, you know, and scholars on e-literature and digital writings, you know, would be very happy you know, to, to uh, connect with you, you know, in near future. So indeed, you know, thank you so much, you know, for your wonderful and engaging and enlightening you know, presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's thank you. been a pleasure. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. And uh, for those, you know, uh, uh, the participants for the next session will be presenting their papers. So it will start at 11.30. So I think, you know, since, you know, the lecture has been brought forward, so we can wait till 1130 for the next session to be to start, you know, we have some time. At least you know, 26 minutes more for the next, you know, paper presentation. We have two parallel sessions, A and B, and which will start at 1130. So since, uh, you know, lecture, you know, our inaugural session has finished a little bit early. What we'll do is that, you know, you can take a break. And those of you uh, who will be presenting the papers in the first session uh, can, in the meantime, you know, take some, you know, brief and prepare yourself. For the... So we'll be online, but, you know, we'll wait till the next session starts. Great. So, Aditi. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah.